<laughs> that you know that the most powerful pirate of all time in terms of numbers of a fleet is actually a woman? Today we will dare a glance at three brave, incredibly ballsy and, well, quite frankly, terrifying pirates. Let's dive right in! Shi Yang, born around Qinhui, Guangdong province in China in 1775, was probably a sex worker on a floating tanker brothel when she met infamous pirate captain Zheng Yi. Zheng Yi came from a well-known pirate family with roots tracing back to the Ming Dynasty. He consistently enlarged his pirate fleet by abducting young boys, adopting them and then forcing them into piracy. Those adopted sons, or kidnapped boys, later on became captains of allied ships. So, as you can imagine, when Shi Yang married Captain Zheng Yi, he was already quite a force in the South China Sea. But when the Vietnamese Tai Son dynasty collapsed, the fleet of Zheng Yi, as well as many other pirate captains, lost their patronage. Since they fought Qing China before, and as foreign powers were establishing their influence in the area, too, they needed to unite forces. Shi Yang, now called Zheng Yi Sao, meaning the wife of Zheng Yi, played a crucial part in uniting the pirates of the South China Sea into the Guangdong Pirate Confederation. Each captain had to give up some of his autonomy for the greater good, and as you can imagine, it was not an easy task to convince the pirate leaders to do so. The Guangdong Pirate Confederation consisted of six fleets known by the color of their flags. Red, black, blue, white, yellow and green. Zheng Yi commanded the biggest fleet sailing under the red flag. Roughly five years after the confederation came into being, Captain Zheng Yi goes overboard in a violent storm. Zheng Yi Sao, his wife, now takes over the command over the entire confederation. She's already quite respected by the pirate captains due to her role in the initial negotiations of the confederation. Thus, she leads the fleets into a new era. Under her lead, the confederation becomes considerably more active, fighting major powers such as the East India Company, the Portuguese Empire and Qing China. Even though an adopted son of the deceased pirate Captain Zheng Yi, surprise surprise, is now the former commander of the Red Flag Fleet, Zheng Yi Sao, who has an intimate sexual relationship with him, is the boss. He follows her order and, as reported, always consulted her before steering the ship into conflicts. With two very tactical sea fights, the Red Flag Fleet manages to diminish the Chinese provincial fleet by half in only two months and cleared the entrance to the Pearl River. As they gained now access into mainland China through the Pearl River, maritime combat becomes more aggressive. Zheng Yisao takes in battles the control of the Red Flag Fleet and sometimes also from other fleets. Their success strike though ends in July 1809, when the Qing Dynasty manages to destroy the entire White Flag Fleet of the Confederation. Zheng Yi Sao takes bitter revenge. It's like she said, you are trying to challenge me? Well, you see what I can do. Less than one month later, every single fleet of the Confederation participates in a massive raid. Under Zheng Yi Sao's command, they capture ships and civilians. Numerous villages, settlements and towns fall victim to the rampaging pirates, counting for approximately 12,000 deaths. With the confederation being seemingly uncontrollable and undefeatable, Qing officials now seek the help of foreign powers. And with the support of the Portuguese Empire, they manage to block the Red Flag Fleet in Tong Chong Bay in the Pearl River. The situation turns into a stalemate between the Sino-Portuguese fleet and the pirates. Indeed, the commander of the Qing fleet became so frustrated that he converted some of his ships into fire ships. However, due to the wind, some of them came back and ignited ships of his own fleet. Well, 
didn't work that well. The other fire ships that actually made it to the Red Flag fleet were extinguished at shore and used as firewood. I can only imagine the reactions on the scene of Portuguese ships with Jung Isao turning something that was supposed to be a malicious attack into something practical for her own fleet, right? It's like a big middle finger, kind of. Well, with turning winds, <laughs> Jung Isao finally manages to break through the blockade and to vanish into the South China Sea. While the Sino Portuguese fleet lost at least three ships, the Red Fleet lost zero. However, the blockade throws a shadow upon Jean Isao's leading qualities and causes friction in the Confederation. The Black Flag fleet even openly battles Jean Isao's ships before its captain and the crew defect to the enemy. The Black Flag fleet is now in the hands of the Qing Empire. Moreover, with the newly gained insight into the Confederation structures, provided happily by the former Black Flag fleet captain, the Qing Empire begins to successfully cut off the pirate supply chains. Now, Zheng Yisao faced some severe infrastructural problems. Not only was the supply situation on the ships critical, the confederation was also only held by a few charismatic leaders and seemed to break apart. As that hadn't been enough, the British and Portuguese furthermore joined forces with the Qing Empire to protect the coasts, as a rampaging pirate fleet within their area of influence was also not in their interest, of course. Zheng Yisao considers to surrender to the Qing Empire only because of all the above reasons combined, and she will. In 1810, she goes with children and women to a negotiation with the Qing official, which results in her being pacified and the surrender of over 17,000 pirates and nearly 230 ships. Climbing up the leadership ladder with extraordinary intelligence and foresight, rising up to the commander of the biggest pirate fleet of all time, with the confederation consisting at its height in total over 16,000 pirates on over 1,800 ships, Jenny Sao can be definitely counted as a pretty significant historical badass. From one badass to two others. Anne Bonnie and Mary Reed, oh boy, is that a story. Although they were born hundreds of miles away from each other, both Anne and Mary were disguised as boys in their childhood to dodge poverty and disgrace. They have quite some similarities, so let's dive right in. May Morg Reed was the result of an extramarital love affair. Her mother, who was married to a seafarer who went missing while being at sea, decided in financial distress and just after her only son died, to disguise Mary as her deceased son in order to receive monetary support from her mother-in-law. Kind of fucked up, right? Still dressed as a boy, Mary found work as a footboy and later was employed on a ship. She even joined the British military on the war against the Spanish succession. Mary was an excellent fighter and her sex was never revealed, until she fell in love with a Flemish soldier. They bought an inn in Breda Castle in the Netherlands. I have been there myself. Folks, visit. <laughs> it's very cool. And as her husband dies early, she gives up her well, quite ordinary life and joins as her alter ego, Mark, the military in the Netherlands. But since there was no war happening, there was apparently not enough adrenaline in for her. <laughs> so she quit soon after, was hired on a ship, and eventually her route over the sea led her to Nassau. There, she'll meet Calico Jack and Anne Bonnie. Before we continue her story, let's have a look at Anne's. Anne Bonnie was born out of wedlock as a daughter of a maid and her employer, a married lawyer. But then I tried to cover the incidents up by dressing Anne like a boy and pretending that it was a distant relative. But of course, his wife discovered the fraud and made it to a public scandal. Hence, Anne's parents moved to the British colonies in America, namely Charleston, in what is now South Carolina, to start a new life. And there, Anne's father became a wealthy plantation owner. As a young adult, Anne visits the port and the bars in Charleston quite frequently, where she encounters at some point a seafarer who occasionally engages in pirating activities. 
against her father's will and is marrying this pirate and gets, as a consequence, kicked out of her family's house and deprived of any possible inheritance. It is said that, as a result, Anne has burned down his plantation in revenge. This is not confirmed, though, and might have also been just a story that Anne told about herself to make her seem more reckless. Not a bad thing for a pirate, right? Together with her new husband, she is sailing to the Bahamas, today's Nassau, a refuge for pirates. Here, in a tavern, she meets Calico Jack Rackham, a famous English pirate who also created the Jolly Roger, the infamous pirate flag that we all know. Anne's story as a pirate begins right there. At this time, Anne's husband was basically a snitch to the governor. Due to his reports, a multitude of pirates have been arrested and prosecuted. Anne dislikes his activity and spends more time in the taverns of Nassau to connect with fellow pirates. She begins a romantic relationship with Calico Jack and eventually leaves her husband to serve on the ship on which Calico Jack was hired as a steersman. Anne, however, enters the ship, of course as a man. As it became apparent that she was pregnant, Calico Jack dropped her off in Cuba, where she gave birth to a son. She then rejoined the ship shortly after, married Calico Jack while at sea, and steals together with Mary Reed, who joined the crew, and Calico Jack a ship. The three of them begin recruiting in Nassau, and with their new crew, were pirating the seas around Jamaica. On the ship, Anne will confess that she has feelings for Mary, revealing herself as a woman. This confession ultimately leads to Mary's revelation of her sex, too. That must have been quite an interesting moment. <laughs> well, since Calico Jack already sensed the feelings of attraction of his wife toward Mary and expresses jealousy, he ultimately becomes an accomplice in their disguise, as Anne tells him that Mary is female indeed, too. Nonetheless, we do not know exactly, though, how the relationship between the three of them on the ship actually played out. As with regard to the crew, it seems that Mary and Annie's sex was either not discovered or not made a topic among the seafarers. Anne, as well as Mary, took part in combat alongside men and swore, fought and drank just as diligently as them. After both Mary and Anne made it on the list of the most wanted pirates, due to their activities, they were hunted. In 1720, during a party on the ship, a sloop under the commission of the governor of Jamaica launches a surprising attack on the crew. It was an easy fight for them. <laughs> most crew members were either too drunk to probably engage in a fight, or, well, they fled to the docks only to be captured soon after. Both Anne and Mary, however, defended the ship on deck. Mary allegedly killed one of the attackers and wounded many others. Anne, according to the captain of the attacking sloop, even ridiculed Calico Jack by saying these famous words. Had you fought like a man, you need not have been hanged like a dog. While Jack and 11 other crew members were hanged in November 1720, Anne and Mary both pleaded their bellies, asking for mercy because of pregnancy which led to a stay of execution until they gave birth. Mary most likely died in prison. However, what happened to Anne Bonny remains a mystery. No records of her being executed can be found, so maybe she managed to escape, since all evidence of her stops right there. So, even though some of you might have heard of Anne Bonny and Mary Reed before, there is even a statue right now dedicated to them in the UK, which is super cool, isn't it? <laughs> They have been forgotten from history for a really, really long time. Why is that? Right in the later 18th and 19th century, we're worried that women who were supposed to know their place as wives, mothers and servants might get some ideas about living as men's equals and loving each other. In fact, the Criminal Law Amendment Act of 1885 made gross indecency, which mainly means male homosexuality, cross-dressing men, and drag, punishable. Lesbianism was not mentioned in the law at all, since the ruling party, white men of course, expressed their anxiety about drawing attention to the topic, as it could encourage women to try it, and subsequently destabilize the patriarchal order. How insecure!
here you have to be, right, that you punish men for loving each other or dressing in a gender-fluid way, as these activities were considered to destroy the image of the superior, strong, cis man. Oh no. And on the other hand, to keep silence about the fact that homosexuality exists among all genders, with the thought that if women only knew they could love other women, they would do so and abandon men for good. <laughs> well, if that isn't security, guys, I don't know what is. <laughs> Well, both Anne and Mary were revolutionary. Anne and Mary broke so many gender boundaries, from marrying wherever they wanted, to, you know, being in the military, being on the seas, owning their own property, owning who they love, and overpowering men in combat. Both women were cross-dressing, gender fluid, moving between living as men and as women, and queer. By the way, side note, we are further diving into that topic in an upcoming series called History of Feminism, where we are also going to talk about the right to, you guessed it, love. Of course, in all forms of the colors of the rainbow. <laughs> so consider subscribing if you do not want to miss this series coming up. Until then, if you want to dive deeper into Anne's and Mary's extraordinary life, I leave a link down in the description for a podcast called Hell Cats. The series has healthy doses of treasure hunting and dueling, but it also explores themes of queer love and gender expression. So go check that out if you're interested. Guys, I hope you enjoyed the second episode of Her Story, a series to make female contributions in the world more visible. In the next episode, we will talk about female pioneers in sports. So hope to see you there and until then, Besitos, have a lovely, empowered, kick-ass day, ladies, gentlemen, and rainbow friends, and see you next time. Bye-bye.